Meet Dr. Daniel Amen, a celebrity psychiatrist, a brain health expert, and a 12-time New York Times bestselling author. So if I'm right, and I am, you need brain envy. You need to love your brain. The mission is to end mental illness by creating a revolution in brain health. Today we discuss all things brain health, dementia, Alzheimer's, and ADHD, and debunk a few myths along the way. Come on, we need to get into the 21st century. Psychiatrists are the only medical doctors who virtually never look at the organ they treat. Think about that. If you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. Well, Dr. Amen, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for making your way on a very rainy day here in Los Angeles to spend time with me. I'm looking forward to discussing all things brain health, optimizing brain health, focus, memory, cognition, preventing things like cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's. I'm interested in the mutability of the brain and brain health. And we're going to talk about your new book also, of course, Raising Mentally Strong Kids. I'm a parent of four kids. This is very interesting to me. Um, but I think the two primary motivating things that, that made me most excited about sitting down with you today is first, a little over a year ago, I was diagnosed with ADHD, which came as quite a surprise. <laughs> Many questions for you about this. Uh, it was not something that I thought would be something I would be associated with. The second is that my mother is currently in the throes of dementia, obviously a quite devastating situation, as you know all too well. And so I want to learn as much as I can uh, about how to help her, how to help my dad, as you also might imagine, uh, is in a very challenging situation. And of course, to do everything I can to avoid a similar peril for myself. And as much as that might sound like I'm trying to make this about me, I'm actually not. Maybe a little bit with the ADHD part, but when you consider the statistics on dementia and Alzheimer's, it really is about all of us, isn't it? I kind of looked up some statistics about an hour ago, and it's quite devastating the extent to which these diseases of dementia are, are kind of taking over and growing at alarming rates. In 2023, 6.7 million Americans over 65 have Alzheimer's, which is like one in nine, 55 million around the globe. Two-thirds of these people are women, which is fascinating, and it's very much on the rise. I saw some statistics like by 2060, the CDC predicts a sevenfold increase, and globally from 55 million to 139 million by 2050. So this is a problem that is going to leave very few people untouched. No question. I mean, if you're blessed to live to 85, you have a one in two chance of being diagnosed with dementia. One in two. One in two. Which means it's either you or your partner, and that's horrifying. But what most people don't know is you can have an impact on that. And since 2005, I wrote a book with my friend Rod Shankle called Preventing Alzheimer's. And I updated it in 2017 with Memory Rescue. And the big idea is if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And you talked about your mom having it. The mnemonic that we'll talk about is called Bright Minds. And the G in Bright Minds is genetics, but we don't think about it properly. Oh, well, I'm overweight because my family's overweight, or I have hypertension because it runs in my family, or I have diabetes because it runs in my family, or I have Alzheimer's disease, or I'm vulnerable to it, and there's nothing I can do about it. And that's a lie. Genes increase your vulnerability, and they teach you what you should be doing. So, for example, I have Six children, three of them are adopted. Two of my nieces we adopted because their parents couldn't stop with drugs and alcohol, and it was a disaster for these kids. And I tell my nieces, if you never drink or do drugs, you're never going to have a problem. 
But if you do, it could be serious. You need to be on an alcohol drug prevention program every day mm. of your life. I have obesity and heart disease in my family. I'm going to be 70 this year. I'm not overweight and I don't have heart disease because I'm on an obesity heart disease prevention program every day of my life. So if you have it in your family, as soon as you know, you should be serious about preventing these 11 major risk factors. I want to get into all those strategies, uh, but let's talk a little bit about what's driving this, what is causing this. I mean, I would imagine a portion of the spike that we're seeing, this increase in incidence, is related to the fact that people are living long and baby boomers are aging up. But also, I suspect that lifestyle habits are contributing to this as well with the increase in type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and the like. So, what's causing cognitive decline are seriously unhealthy lifestyle and undisciplined minds did you know depression doubles the risk of alzheimer's in women and quadruples it in men what is the relationship between depression and dementia so many people think if you're an older person and you get depressed it's actually a precursor to dementia. They're both brain diseases or brain problems, if you will. And it's critical in the M in Bright Minds mental health stuff. So I was so excited about this mm. because what I came to realize, I started looking at the brain in 1991, and we've looked at over 250,000 scans. But early on, I came to realize you are not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better, and I can prove it. And so if I look at your brain, and then you have a car accident, your brain's going to be worse. If I look at your brain, and then you go on a drug bender, your brain is going to be worse. If I look at your brain, and then you, all of a sudden you stop sleeping, or you go through a divorce, odds are your brain's going to change in a negative way. But I also did the big NFL study, when the NFL was sort of lying, they had a problem mm -hmm. with traumatic brain injury in football. 80% of my players got better. I could see the damage, but when they go on a brain healthy program, 80%, their brains looked better anywhere from two to six months later. That's exciting. I was a consultant on the movie Concussion, and, and I was sort of bummed because the movie's sort of a downer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was Is about, that the Will Smith one? The Will Smith yeah, one. Yeah, I remember that. And it's like, where's the hope? And the message on football dementia or CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the message in our society is wrong. It's like, oh, you have this. It's chronic, progressive, untreatable. And so players don't come and get help because they feel hopeless. It's like, no, get help early, probably while you're still playing, mm -hmm. so that you can begin to reverse the damage. It's the big, exciting lesson over the last 30 years in neuroscience. Neuroplasticity. You're not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better. There's an area of the brain called the hippocampus. That's why I collect seahorses. It's Greek for seahorse. It's shaped like a seahorse. Every day, you are making 700 new stem cells in the hippocampus, or I think of them as baby seahorses. Your behavior is going to grow them, or it's going to shrink them. And so if you're vulnerable to dementia, that's the area that gets hit early in dementia. Mm -hmm. And you want to love those seahorses, nourish them, feed them, teach them, rather than get them drunk or stoned or shrivel them. Your main protocol in evaluating people's brains is this imaging technology called SPECT, right? So can you describe what that is? So can I tell the pre-story yeah. just to put it in context? So when I was 18, Vietnam was still going on. And 
the government had a draft, and I became an infantry medic where my love of medicine was born. But about a year into it, I didn't like being shot at. It just not for me. It's for some people, it's not for me. So I got retrained as an x-ray technician and developed a passion for medical imaging. As our professors used to say, how do you know unless you look? And then 1979, I'm a second year medical student. I just get married. And two months later, my wife tried to kill herself, horrified. Mm -hmm. And I take her to see a wonderful psychiatrist. And I come to realize if he helps her, it won't just help her. It'll help me. It'll help our children, our grandchildren, as they would be shaped by someone who's happier and more stable. So 45 years ago, I fell in love with psychiatry, and I've loved it every day since. But I fell in love with the only medical specialty that never looks at the organ it treats. And I knew it was wrong, and I knew it would change. I just had no idea it'd be part of it. 1991, I'm now a psychiatrist for about a decade. And I went to a lecture at my local hospital on brain spec imaging, single photon emission computed tomography. It's a nuclear medicine study that looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain works. And it basically shows us three things. Healthy activity, too little activity, or too much. How is it doing that? What is the process by which that's revealing itself? So... Again, it's a nuclear medicine study. So what we do is we take a radio pharmaceutical. So you take a radioisotope. We take one we use is called technetium. And technetium has self-esteem problems. It doesn't like being who it is. And it changes shape. And when it changes shape, it produces a photon or a little packet of light that we can measure. So we combine technetium with HMPAO, a medicine that's easily taken up by cells in the brain, combine them, inject them into your arm, and it's called a first-pass extraction. So 70% of it is taken up in your brain in that first pass, or within about two minutes. And then, so... It's the hardest part of the procedure, a little tiny needle into a vein in your arm, inject the medicine, it lights up your brain, and then we can measure it. Have you lay on a camera table? It's not claustrophobic. It's not like an MRI. Uh, people lay on the camera. The camera heads come around your head in about 15 minutes, and we get about 10 million counts or 10 million times that little piece of light hits the crystals in the camera. And then we reconstruct it, and it looks like a brain, and we then can see in your brain, which areas are most active, which areas are healthy, which areas are sleepy, compare it to our massive database. And my eight-year-old grandson can look at a scan and go healthy or not. And it's so helpful to look. And off camera, we talked about controversy. So I start looking at the brain. I'm like a little kid, so excited. And we never make a diagnosis from a scan. So that's really important. We make a diagnosis, like all doctors, with all of the information. Take detailed history. If you came to see us, you'd fill out about an hour's worth of paperwork, talk to our historian for a couple of hours. I mean, we really get to know you. And then we would test your brain. We do a computerized neuropsych assessment. And we would scan your brain. And when you put that puzzle together... It's so powerful. The first patient I ever scanned. So I went from the lecture on brain spec imaging given by the head of the hospital where I worked into Sandy's room. And I didn't met her. I just met her. She tried to kill herself the night before. And as I was talking to her, I'm thinking, she has adult ADD. Impulsive suicide attempt after a fight with a, her husband that she caused. IQ of 144 but never finished college when I go, tell me how you studied. She said, well, I really never did unless it was the night before the test. I put on a pot of coffee, stay up all night, do the mm -hmm. test. She had an eight-year-old son that had ADD. So in my mind, I'm feeling pretty confident about this. But when I broach the subject with her, she's like, oh, adults can't have ADD. And I'm thinking I'm the doctor. She was resistant. I said, well, why don't we look at your brain. And I had been doing a study called quantitative EEG up to that point. 
So I knew I needed to do it twice, once at rest, once while she did a concentration task. And then after I got the results a couple of days later, I'm in her hospital room. She has a table. I put the scans on the table. She had a healthy brain at rest. And when she tried to concentrate, her frontal lobes and her cerebellum, which we'll talk about, dropped. I was so clear. What does that tell you? The harder she tries, the worse it gets. It's a classic, is what I was predicting I would see, because that's what I saw in quantitative EEG. And when I showed her the scans and explained them to her, she starts to cry. And she said, you mean this is not my fault? And I'm like, you know, people who have ADD, it's sort of like people who need glasses. They're not dumb, crazy, or stupid. You know, people wear glasses. I wear glasses to drive. We're not dumb, crazy, or stupid. Our eyeballs are shaped funny. And we wear glasses so we can focus. People have ADD aren't dumb, crazy, or stupid. Their frontal lobes and cerebellum often turn off when they should turn on. So medicine or supplements or other strategies we'll talk about so you can focus. I could see with the image that her shame melted away and her compliance went up and she took the medicine her relationships were better she ended up she was underemployed as many ADD people are finished college got a better job and uh, was in touch with her for about 10 years so this was sort of an inciting incident that allowed you to see the benefits of using this as a diagnostic tool this imaging technology yes yeah I like it when my patients get better. So I went into psychiatry and it was totally personal for me. And I loved it. But I was already getting criticism from it. It's like, oh, we don't do this. It's not standard. It's not what we do. But 1992, all day seminar at the American Psychiatric Association, Brain Specked Imaging and Child Psychiatry, because I'm also a child psychiatrist. And I'm so excited because I'm meeting colleagues who do it. And in 1993, I teach with that group. So I'm like all in on the technology. But it was 1993, lots of pushback from the American Psychiatric Association because it doesn't fit the current diagnostic paradigm. Mm -hmm. It's like, stop giving people the diagnosis of depression. Depression's a symptom cluster. It shouldn't be a diagnosis. It's sort of like chest pain is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis, right? If you have chest pain, it doesn't tell you what's causing it. And it doesn't tell you what to do for it, right? Right. It's just indicia to look deeper and use other diagnostic tools to confirm right. you know, what's happening. But that was 20 years ago. Is there a sense that the medical establishment has changed its tune? Because if you look at your Wikipedia page, it's like a it's like a diatribe on, you know, the lack of scientific efficacy with respect to this imaging technology. Yeah, I don't know what to do about Wikipedia. Um 2016, January, I published 80 studies. People go, oh, he's never published his work. It's like, dude, do you read? Discover Magazine listed our research as one of the top 100 stories in science for 2015. I was pretty excited about that. 2021, the Canadian Association of Nuclear Medicine wrote procedure guidelines on SPEC, basically as if I wrote them. And five of the 10 authors had been my students at some point. I've had 10,000 medical and mental health professionals referred to our 11 clinics. And 250,000 scans yeah. that you reviewed. So that's a, people from 155 It's a massive countries. data set. What are some of the general trends that you see? Like what can you extract from that giant data set that speaks to brain health, the mutability of brain health, and the types of conditions that you see most consistently in the patients that end up in your clinics? Well, can I, can I stay with the controversy just a little yeah. bit longer? Because it really irritates me. The people who criticize me say, oh, he's only doing it for money. Oh, you can't see these things in the scans, even though they're not experts. But what's the alternative? I mean, I had said it earlier, mm -hmm. psychiatrists are the 
only medical doctors who virtually never look at the organ they treat. Think about that. And obviously, if you have a brain dysfunction, that's going to dictate a you know, mental health outcome. Well, if we agree that your brain controls everything you do, right, how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people, and when it works right, you tend to work right, and when it's troubled, you're more likely to have trouble in your life. If your brain, the moment-by-moment function of your brain creates your mind, then why wouldn't you assess the organ that you're you're working on and so just a little more history 1993 i start to get anxious because i have two big flaws and i've worked on them a lot but i like people to like me and you can't change a medical specialty if you're anxious about what people think of you and i hate conflict I'm a middle child. You and I both. I hate conflict, and I like people to like me. And all that changed in 1995. So I spent, from 1993 to 1995, just anxious. Because I knew I had to do this, right? There's not a choice. Once you look, you can't Mm -hmm. unlook. And 1995, I get a call late one night from my sister-in-law, Sherry, who told me my nine-year-old nephew, Andrew, had attacked a little girl on the baseball field for no particular reason. And I'm like, what? And she said, Danny, he's different. He's mean. He doesn't smile anymore. I went into his room today and found two pictures he had drawn. One of them, he was hanging from a tree. The other picture, he was shooting other children. So if you think about it, he's Columbine or Sandy Hook or Parkland, Florida waiting to happen. And I'm like, I want to see him tomorrow. And they lived eight hours from me. So they brought him to me. I'm like, buddy, what's going on? And he's like, Uncle Danny, I'm just mad all the time. I'm like, is anybody hurting you? No. Is anybody teasing you? No. Is anybody touching you in places that shouldn't be touching you? No. And 999 child psychiatrists out of 1,000 would put him on medicine and therapy. And because of my experience, I already scanned a 1,000 people at that point. I'm like, he's got a left temporal lobe problem. And so I'm like, I held his hand while he held his teddy bear and got scanned. And he was missing the function of his left temporal lobe. I'd never seen it. I've seen it a 100 times since then. It turned out he had a cyst the size of a golf ball occupying the space of his left temporal lobe. And I told his pediatrician, I said, you find somebody to take it out because he wasn't in my neighborhood. And he talked to three neurologists. All of them said they wouldn't touch the cyst until he had real symptoms. At which point, I lost my mind, and I start screaming at the pediatrician of a homicidal, suicidal child who attacks people for no reason. What do you mean real symptoms? And he got anxious, and he said, I think they mean like seizures or he loses consciousness. I'm like, serious? And in my head, I'm like, neurologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons will do stuff. So I called UCLA, talked to the head of the pediatric neurosurgery department, Jorge Lazaro, and he said, Dr. Amen, when these cysts are symptomatic, we drain them. He's obviously symptomatic. And after the surgery, I got two calls. One from my sister-in-law who said the surgery went really well, and when Andrew woke up, he smiled at her. She said, Danny, he's not smiled for a year. And then I got a call from Dr. Lazarev who said, oh my God, Dr. Amon, that cyst was so aggressive that put so much pressure on Andrew's brain that thinned the bone over his left temporal lobe. So his skull had been thinned. He said if he would have been hit in the head with the basketball, it would have killed him instantly. Either way, he would have been dead in six months. That's an amazing story. What's so interesting is the idea that our personalities are not static, that something amiss with the brain could completely change a person's outlook on life, how they show up in the world, the thoughts that they're entertaining. And with, in the case of that example, like a simple procedure, not a simple procedure, but a, a procedure could completely change that. 
good or bad, yeah. right? It can go could either go the other way. way. But after Andrew, and you know, it's now thirty years later, twenty nine years later, Andrew's married, has two children, has his own business. I mean, he's normal. And it was that moment I lost my anxiety and my need for you to like me. Mm. That's when the war began mm -hmm. to try to change psychiatry to become, let's like, come on, we need to get into the 21st century. And 1979, when I told my dad I wanted to be a psychiatrist, he asked me why I didn't want to be a real doctor. Yeah, he wasn't happy about Why anything. I wanted to be a nut doctor and hang out yeah. with nuts all day long. But that he just was just reflecting what society believes that you're weak if you have a mental health problem, you're bad if you have a behavioral problem. And th the images clearly taught me free will is not zero or a hundred, mm -hmm. that free will is gray. And I ended up testifying in some death penalty cases. And um, so if I'm right, and I am, that means 40,000 psychiatrists and hundreds of thousands, family practice doctors, OBGYN, internists, that they're practicing witchcraft by making diagnoses based on symptom clusters with no biological data. Last year, 337 million prescriptions for antidepressants. That's insane. What's happening in our society is just tragic and we need a different way and the mission i have in my life is crazy but the mission is to end mental illness by creating a revolution in brain health which is why i'm so excited about brain it's health. a bold statement it's a great mission i love it um i think ancillary to what you just shared is there's a lot of misnomers when it comes to mental health like language is important and the words that we associate with some of the things that that people experience are perhaps not in the best interest of healing and and welfare can you talk a little bit about that like the idea of just talking about disease in general with respect to mental health? So of the 337 million prescriptions written for antidepressants, virtually no one was talked to about their diet, about their sleep habits, about if they turn on the news first thing in the morning. I love the idea of getting my patients excited about making their brains better rather than you have borderline personality disorder and you're probably not going to get better, but here are the things to do. Or you're bipolar, you're going to need to take this medication for the rest of your life. Um, I'm in Justin Bieber's docuseries, Seasons, mm -hmm. and he came to me diagnosed with bipolar disorder on lithium. I scanned him, that's not what he had. But can you imagine being... 23 and people saying you have a mental illness you're always going to have this mental illness you need to be on this medicine for the rest of your life that's insane with no biological data or one of my favorite stories is adriana who i just dearly love normal 16 year old beautiful goes to yosemite they think it's a magic moment when they're surrounded by six deer 10 days later, she becomes aggressive. She starts to hallucinate. She's paranoid. She's hospitalized, given a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And after three hospitalizations, multiple medications, the family spent $100,000. Adriana's a shell. She comes to our clinic, sees one of our doctors. Her brain's on fire. Why is her brain on fire? Uh, you know, we see inflammation. Turned out she had Lyme disease. On an antibiotic, within a year, she's normal. She graduated from Pepperdine. She's got a master's degree from the University of London. She's normal. I think infectious disease, and we can talk about COVID because it's part of it, is a major cause of psychiatric problems. And nobody knows about it mm. because people aren't looking at the brain. And so you asked me, you know, what are sort of the big lessons I've learned? Mild traumatic brain injury is a major cause of psychiatric illness. And nobody knows it because they don't look. One of my friends was mountain biking and had an accident. He fell, 
broke his helmet, didn't lose consciousness, never had an anxiety disorder, panic attack, depression, never in his whole life. He's in his 50s. All of a sudden, he's having panic attacks. Doctor put him on Prozac and Xanax, very common combination. And for the wrong brain, it's big trouble. He, he became suicidal. He saw me on TV and I came to see him. He had a dent in the left front side of his brain, his left frontal lobe, his left temporal lobe. I'm like, do you have a brain injury? No. Are you sure? What I found is you got to ask people multiple times, do you ever have a brain injury? When I see it on the scan, I'll generally find it. Do you ever fall out of a tree, off a fence, dive into a shallow pool, car accident, cushion plane sports? He's like, oh my God, two weeks before I had my first panic attack, I had a mountain biking accident and I broke the helmet. I didn't think anything of it because I didn't lose consciousness. Consciousness is a brain stem phenomenon. So you can really do damage to your brain and not lose consciousness because you don't damage your that brain stem. It. Yeah. Yeah, Phineas Gage, the famous case in neurosurgical history, was a railroad construction worker in 1848, and his job was in explosions. He'd explode out the rock so they could lay the railroad tracks. And one day there was an accident that happened. His three-foot tamping iron, he was tamping down the fuse and sand and gunpowder, and he dropped the rod caused a spark, then an explosion, it went through a missile underneath his left cheekbone, took out the left front side of his brain, landed 30 yards away. And he looked to his friend and said, did you see that? <laughs> and then he looked to another friend, he said, did you see that? He didn't lose consciousness, but obviously wow. damaged his brain, changed his personality. He was conscientious and a man of good character before that and then he got fired because he couldn't stop swearing and he didn't show up and he had these crazy ideas and then was a stagecoach driver and then moved to where all these people move which is california in the case of somebody who suffered a, a cte some kind of brain injury or in the case of someone like justin bieber who's being diagnosed with bipolar disorder i mean not for nothing. Like, how about just the fact that he's so young and so famous and so wealthy? Like, how do you not have some kind of dysfunction being so young with a young brain trying to navigate that type of world? But I yeah, guess they that, almost killed that boy. He was pretty out of control for a while, and he seems to be great now. That's all I know. I don't know him personally. And if you read his mom's book, I mean, it's public knowledge. He grew up with a lot of uncertainty and trauma and anxiety. Her parents didn't want her to have Justin, and she ended up going in the Salvation Army home front wed mother. Oh, wow. And there's a lot. So there's some childhood trauma stuff there. Childhood yeah. trauma. And then you think early fame, which is one of the worst things for brain because you wear out your pleasure centers in the brain all of that excitement and then unlimited money with very poor supervision in a brain that doesn't finish developing until 25 i mean just see sort of yeah it's a recipe for disaster some kind of dysfunction and you know one of my other sort of patients i dearly love miley cyrus got the grammy this year for song of the year makes me emotional because the song's really about love and loving yourself. But it was a shit show for a yeah. long time. She's been on a journey, hasn't she's she? She's been on a journey. I'm just so proud of her because she's in charge of her life rather than fame's in charge or drugs are in charge or other people are in charge. I mean, you know, I work really hard with my patients for them to become good CEOs of their life, but you have to take care of the executive center in your life, which is your prefrontal cortex, largest in humans and any other animal by far. If you damage it with head trauma, drugs, alcohol, bad food, not sleeping, social media, it's not a good prescription.